Okay, welcome back to our second part of conditional probability and independence. <clears throat> so now in front of you is a tree diagram that's set up, and we're going to use that tree diagram to extrapolate some other information. So this is a study of adults who use the internet, and uh, then we're measuring the percentage by uh, which segment of the population, adults, 18 to 29, 30 to 49, and above 50, used uh, video sharing. So you can see uh, adult internet users, and then the percent of the total uh, that uh, use the internet out of the total 100%, so 27%, 45%, and 28% of the adult population, so this should add up to 1. And then of those, what percent use video sharing? So 70% of the population, 18 to 29, use something like uh, YouTube, 30% did not. 51 used video sharing, 49% did not. 26 used video sharing for 50 and older, and 74 did not. All right, so the question is what percent of adults use video sharing? So we're going to use this tree diagram. All these uh, values are added up. Uh, and then we're going to identify what they are. And we're going to total all of the yes values, so use the sharing. And we're going to come up with a value of 0.4913. So here we're using the tree diagram, but we're going to just sum the total of specific branches in order to understand what percent met some criteria. All right, so this brings us to homework 5.3.3. Sorry, this is homework 5.3.4. All right, so a study compared internet uh, media usage to grades. Students were classified as heavy, moderate, and light by percentage. Uh, <clears throat> and so you can see that total adds up to 100. And then of that, 52% of the heavy users received A-B grades. Uh, the balance received less than that. 68% of moderate users received A-B grades. And 70%, 74% of light users received A-B grades. So you can see based on the internet usage, internet media usage, that affected or there was some relationship between that usage and A-B grades. So use a tree diagram, state plan, do conclude. What percent of, and answer the question, what percent of students get A-B grades? So I'm going to leave this up for a moment, and then I'm going to move on to our fourth topic, right, independence and a special multiplication rule, which we actually have already reviewed. Uh, so we talked about independent events. So dependent events are events in which the occurrence or probability of one does have an impact on the occurrence or probability of another. Um, so we've already uh, given some examples of this. So I choose, choose two numbers from a hat, one through five. After I choose the first number, one, I do not put it back into the hat, so there's only four numbers left. And I choose the second number. The fact that I've removed a number from the hat increases the likelihood that I will choose numbers two through five because there are only four numbers left. So I go from one-fifth probability for a given number to one-fourth probability for the next number. So the fact that I have not replaced that initial number back in is going to affect the outcome of the second number because I am reducing the number of possible outcomes uh, in the denominator. All right, so dependent events now probability of x and probability of y are dependent, then the probability of them both happening, probability of x times the probability of y, does not equal probability of uh, probability of x times the probability of y, but it does equal the probability of x times the probability of y given the probability of x has happened. So going back to our example, the probability of choosing a number 1 through 5 is 0.20. And then a 3, so probability of choosing a 1 is 0 0.20. Then the probability of choosing a 3 on the next selection, given that you have not replaced 1 into the hat, is going to be the probability of uh, uh, 0 0.20 times 0.25. Not 0.2 times 0.2, because we've changed the denominator. It's now 1 fifth times 1 fourth. So the probability of choosing a 1 times the probability of choosing a 3 given that you've already chosen a 1, since they are dependent events. So I end up with 0.20 times 0.25, which is 0 
So the action of removing the one made the probability of choosing a three more likely because only four numbers remained. And so these are not independent, but they are dependent events. All right, so the general multiplication rule for dependent events is not probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, but it is equal to probability of A times the probability of B given that A has happened. This is the general rule anyway, but as we mentioned before, the probability of B given A with independent events is also equal to the probability of B. Okay, so determining dependence or independence of events algebraically, if the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, then the events are dependent, independent. If not, then the events are dependent. If the probability of B is equal to the probability of B given A, then the events are independent. If not, then the events are dependent. So uh, here is a, again, a list. which you can copy down for your reference. All right, so let's go through algebraically some problems. Probability of A is 1 fourth. Probability of B is 3 tenths. The probability of A and B is 3 over 80. Let's determine if these are dependent or independent. So let's see if you can answer these problems on your own. All right, so 1 fourth times 3 tenths is 3 fortieths, which is not equal to 3 eightieths. So these are dependent events. 0. 0.4 times 0. 0.4 is 0. 0.6. It's not equal to A and B. These events are also dependent. Then the probability of A times the probability of B, 2 fifths times 3 fourths is 6 twentieths, which is also equal to 3 tenths, which is the probability of A and B. So the number 3 is independent, right? The probability of A times the probability of B is equal to the probability of A and B, then these events are independent. If not, then the events are dependent. All right, so this brings us to homework 5.3.5. Uh, okay, I'm going to let you copy this down. So you're going to determine uh, algebraically or mathematically whether or not these events are independent or dependent. Oh, uh, all right, so I'm going to move on from this. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, tree diagrams and the multiplication rule, I believe, again. Or actually, we're going to talk about... Okay, actually, before we move on, uh, I want to talk about an example here and how to find uh, some values uh, based on uh, the multiplication rule. So... This is an example with the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986. Uh, exploded uh, on takeoff. Seven members were killed. Um, I was actually in college at the time, my freshman year. Uh, and uh, they ultimately determined that the failure was an O-ring that connected the joints to the booster rockets. Uh, they determined under these conditions that there was a 0.977 chance that the O-ring would function properly but there were six O-rings and all had to function. So assuming the O-rings uh, function independently of each other, find the probability the shuttle would launch safely. So we're going to use uh, the multiplication rule, not necessarily a tree diagram, uh, to solve this problem. And so what we would need then is uh, for all of these uh, to uh, occur, or to function properly. And so the event of each occurring uh, would be the event number one, so O-ring number one functioning properly is 0.977. And then O-ring number two is times 0.977. And then times O-ring number three is 0.977. And then times O-ring number uh, um, there's six of these times 0.977, that's four, times 0.977, that's five, times 0.977, uh, that's six. Um, so if we take all these, multiply together, 
we get approximately 0.87. So this would be 0.977 uh, to the power of 6. We get approximately 0.87% uh, chance that uh, the O-rings would not fail and a 0.13% chance that uh, the O-rings would fail, which is a very significant percent uh, given the nature of the program. Um, so if you want to find probabilities of consecutive events that have the same probability, then you just raise it to the power of the number of times that uh, you would have to see that success occur. All right, so the other part of this is um, at least one. So when I consider talk about at least one, uh, we may come back to talk about this uh, at a later time, but in probability, uh, at least one means uh, everything but zero. And so we're going to find out uh, the probability of at least one by taking, uh, making at least one uh, event A and then zero not A. So we're going to use the complement in order to solve this problem. So uh, let's review the problem. There are two types of tests for HIV. One takes several days, the other is immediate. The problem with immediate tests is that they have a 0 0.004 chance of producing a false positive. If a clinic conducts 200 tests, what is the probability that at least one test is a false positive? So the probability of at least one test is the probability of something happening, so one, minus the probability that all tests are false. Because we either have the probability of that all tests are false, right? This is event A, complement of A, and this is A. So it's either at least one test is false, right? So one through 200, and this is no tests are false. So we're going to use the complement rule in order to figure this out. So instead of counting one, two, three, four to 200, we can solve it this way by taking the complement of the event and then subtracting that from 1. Right? Because 1 is the sum of the probabilities of all the occurrences in this probability tree. All right, so the probability that all the tests are uh, not false would mean that you'd have for each test 0.996 is the probability that the test is not false to the power of 200. And you'd subtract that from 1. So that's what I did here. 1 minus 0.4486 leaves me with 0.5514. And this value then corresponds back to uh, the probability of at least one test is false. All right, so just some side information. I'm not going to give you homework on that. All right, so now we're going to move on to calculating conditional probabilities. All right, so uh, this is, again, going back to our table in relative frequencies. An automaker tests auto parts to determine if the part is defective or not. Sometimes a part passes when it is defective, and sometimes it fails when it is not. So we want to find the probability that a defective part passes and find the probability that a non-defective part fails. So let's see if you can use your knowledge of relative frequencies in order to solve this problem. And I'm going to give you the answer. All right, so the probability that a defective part passes. I have a total of 39 defective parts. The probability that it passes, I have 3 out of 39. 3 out of 39 is 1 over 13, approximately 7.7%. Find the probability that a non-defective part passes. Here's a list of non-defective uh, parts. 450 out of 461. I'm sorry, fails is 11 out of 461, or 2.4% chance. All right, so there is a possibility that a non-defective part fails and that a defective part passes. All right, so as a quality control person, you need to know what these percentages are and understand that uh, your quality control does have some potential issues with it, as most do, to have a false defective or a false pass rate. Um, okay, so let's move on. This brings us to homework 5.3.6. So an automaker tests auto parts to determine if the part is defective. So same thing here. Sometimes a part passes when it's defective and sometimes it fails when it is not. Uh, so you're going to answer these five questions. Uh, there are a couple bonus questions as well as question number five. 
Uh, I'm going to move on. I'm going to stop the video here and then move on to the last part of the discussion. So please copy this down.